what are you talking about, conscience? I didn't fuck up in the last video by forgetting to include an analysis of the cat lady chapter 5. I forgot. And that's not the same thing. Stay tuned for the end of this video where I give my thoughts on that, but today we're revisiting Downfall. In 2016, Harvester Games released a remake of their little 2009 gem. It sought to bring the madness to life in a new format, and was teased at the end of The Cat Lady. It follows the same plotline, with some expansion on a couple of the world's characters, and resembles the new style of The Cat Lady. Only with much more CG. Side note, I streamed all endings of this game on my Twitch channel. Link below. I've already kind of exhausted like all my thoughts on the original, so this video will sort of skim over all the stuff that uh, stays the same. But trust me, there is uh, a surprising amount that's changed. Also, keep in mind that the plot structure of this game is very, like, hallucinatory. So, um, it might be a little bit wonky in the way that I present story beats as, um, some things are, like, very straightforward and, like, can be explained, and some things... Some things just kind of have to be shown for you to, like, get what's going on. So, uh, I will be presenting, like, a good number of scenes or cutscenes that will be largely uncut. But with that being said, we have a lot to cover and you all know the drill, so let's just go. Yeah. It's time to talk about the devil came through your series again. With your hostess around And someday She'll learn how to record her audio Whoa That day Is not today Thank you I'm so very sorry Part 1 Summary before even reaching the menu, we are presented with a prologue cutscene. Young Joe Davis and his brother Robbie are talking on the sidewalk. Robbie tells of a place he knows where gangsters hide their drug money, and he goes off for a bit. And we are now in control of Joe. As Joe walks around town, he sees a sad-looking young girl sitting outside of a cafe. If I was a cat, I'd spend all nine lives with you. Do you really think cats have nine lives? Sure. I like cats. I'm gonna have one when I'm older. Black. Like a devil. Where are you from? Sweden. But you're not blonde. So? I just... Never mind. Nice flowers. Yeah. But I prefer red ones. Why? No reason. I just like red. Why are you sitting here? My mom's inside, eating. And she left you out here? I'm on a diet. That sucks. It's okay. I'm not hungry. Joe offers to show Ivy a place where cats go to die. They find a scruffy black cat there who loves on Ivy and may or may not run from Joe. Apparently, cats don't like Joe much. And then, the ice cream guy comes. Joe tries to order ice cream for both himself and Ivy, but Ivy says she doesn't want any and runs off. Fortunately, they make up with a fist bump as Robbie runs up to meet them. Robbie says he's found the drug money, and the three walk to a building site. Instead of money, however, they find grenades. Robbie picks one up, opting to sell it, but shortly drops it, resulting in him exploding in a much more gruesome scene than in the original game. Please, don't do this to me, Robbie. Do you think we care?
I was in my 20s when we met again. Straight away, I knew it was her. That same smile. Those same emerald eyes. She didn't remember me, I think. It was probably better that way. The chemistry was instant. We fell in love and got married within a few months. I never talked about Robbie. And neither did she. We were happy together. Then our luck ran out. The cracks started to show. But I knew how to fix it. Joe and Ivy, now married, enter the Quiet Haven Hotel and we learn that Ivy has been refusing to speak since the car ride. Joe tries to get some service and Ivy walks off. Ivy? Where are you going? Devil came through here. What? What is that even supposed to mean? We are not alone, Joe. They are watching us. Who? These bad people. They live in the mirrors. They reach out sometimes, trying to grab. They've gone now, but soon they will return. What the hell are you talking about? Can you really not see them? No, I can't. If you close your eyes, you will see them too. They'll devour you whole, Joe. They... they will... No! Get away from him! I have gone now. This is crazy. We need to get you to a doctor, Ivy. I... I really don't know what to do. You don't seem right, Ives. We need to leave right now. Something bad is coming. Yeah, the storm. And that's exactly why we can't leave. There are worse things than the storm, you know. We'll be fine, trust me. Now pull yourself together and follow me. We'll get to our room, get some sleep, 
and I'm sure you'll see things in a different light tomorrow. Upon walking back to the lobby, you find the manageress, who Ivy says is a FUCKING LIAR! They book a room, which unfortunately has no double bed, only two singles. Just before you head up to your room, the manageress tells you that the lady in the room next to yours should not be disturbed. The two head up to their room, and a confrontation begins. What is happening to me, Joe? I know something's been wrong for a long time, but I used to be able to control it. And now, I don't even know who I am anymore. I... I blacked out for a bit, I... I think. And I was dreaming. There was... There was a woman there, in the mirror. She was so fat and naked and covered in blood. I want to be... I want to be alone. What do you mean? Nothing can save us. Maybe we shouldn't be together, Joe. I mean, I've been thinking. Why do you love me? There are so many reasons, Ivy. Where do I start? I never get tired of talking to you. Oh, and this. I like holding you in my arms when you're sad. But most of all, I guess, I... I can be myself around you. You never get tired of talking to me, because we never talk anymore. We stopped talking a long time ago, and you know that. And when was the last time you held me in your arms? Because I can't remember. I'm sure neither can you. And finally, you are wrong thinking you know who you are. Because you're lost, Joe. Just like me. I think it's time to say it loud and clear. Ivy. I'm serious. This stupid holiday, it's never gonna fix anything. It's too late for that. So please, say it, Joe. Say it, so we can both be free. I still love you. No, that's the thing you don't. You have to understand that, Joe. Whatever that was between us, it's gone. Ivy. I'm done talking. Go to sleep and leave me alone. What about you? I'll go to bed soon enough. We need to get up for the breakfast, don't we? 8am, don't be late. I don't care about a fucking breakfast. Why? We might as well play a happy couple one last time. In my dreams, I visit this place. The only one that never changes. My escape. My quiet haven. The two fall asleep and Joe arrives in his dream field. Then he gets chased by his apartment complex on Helen Road. He goes inside the complex and finds his copy of Misery by Stephen King in a locker. He also opens his mailbox to find a note from Frank Zellman, a name oddly familiar to him. Inside is nothing but a ten pound note and a key, with which he unlocks the basement stairs. In the basement, Joe is suddenly approached by a bloody axeman. He gets axed and wakes up on the floor of his hotel room. Ivy? She must have already gone downstairs. It's breakfast time. When Joe gets to the dining room, though, he finds only the manageress and a bunch of dead animal guests. 
Where the fuck is my wife? Oh, she had to go. Not at first. She sat here for a bit. Wrote a note, a letter, I think. Maybe it's to you. But then she met Sophie. Who? They got on like a house on fire. They might just as well have been friends for years. They're still here somewhere. But I don't think she wants you to look for her. Joe? Who is that Sophie? Her room is just behind your wall. 102. I told you it's not good to disturb her. Now that she's awake, she will never leave. The manageress tells you where to find Sophie's room key. But just as you're about to grab it, a mangy black cat swallows the key, leading you to chase him into a room wherein you find nothing but a TV. So, you burn the cat in the furnace to grab the key. Also, you see the Axeman again. Now that you've been numed back into the hotel, you enter Sophie's room. But Ivy isn't there. All you find is young Sophie wearing a mask. Who are you? You know damn well who I am, Joe. Is your name Sophie? <laughs> see? It wasn't that hard now, was it? What is this place? Why all the... mirrors? <laughs> this is the madness, Joe. Let's try to enjoy it while we can. I'm not mad. It's this place that's mad. Where's my wife? She's still around here somewhere, but... Hidden away, so you couldn't find her. She found a monster inside her, and no one can ever see. Even you. It's been... lurking around for quite a while. It's the kind that lives in your mirror, and whispers bad things when you're alone. And if you start listening, it grows stronger. Do you want to see? Just look into one of these broken mirrors here. Sorry for yourself. Isn't she a pretty, pretty girl? <laughs> it doesn't really matter if you believe in monsters, Joe. It won't make them go away, you know? Sometimes, there's just nothing you can do. But sometimes, if you're willing to sacrifice everything, you can achieve the impossible. I'll do anything to save Ivy. Good. Then I'll tell you what to do. So, Sophie says that Joe needs to kill her in order to save Ivy. Be 
it's okay because she's just a memory of Sophie. One of four, and she in particular actually wants to die. Once Joe has killed all four memories of Sophie, she says, the mirror imprisoning Ivy will be open. Also, she knows that you killed the cat. To find the poison to kill Sophie, you are told to find one Dr. Z. And as you walk back into your own room, you find a letter from Ivy on the floor. I miss you. You know. We were good together. Always there. When I was falling. And bad felt better. Every time. With you. As you walk back out, you hear a phone ringing. They're waiting. And now you can use the lift! As you step out onto the second floor to find Dr. Z's room, you are intercepted by the manageress. Basically, she disses Ivy and is super horny for Joe. So after that little interaction, you find your way into room 204 and meet Dr. Z. Hi. What's that? I'm busy. Just get on with it and be quick. What's going on here? Oh, I'll tell you what is going on. Bad, bad things are going on, and I'm not impressed. I love him. Who are you? Why? Have we not been acquainted yet? I think I'd remember a man covered in blood, dressed as a doctor, performing brain surgery. A live brain surgery. Jesus, man. What the? Now this, this here, is called a Lazarus sign. Worry you not, it often occurs post-mortem. But I assure you, this lady has been well and truly dead for quite some time now. Just leave her alone then. I can't. <laughs> I'm going to bring her back. Who is she anyway? What? Who? What do you mean, who? The girl on the table with her head cut open. Oh, her, yes. I'm not quite sure, but my assumption is she is of great significance in all of this. I think her name is... Agnes. Dr. Z offers to help you so long as you bring him a brain for his experiment. Also, there's another part of Ivy's letter on the second floor. I force myself to hate. Still there, deep in my soul, you live. And through my eyes, every day, you cry. So you go down to the basement to pick up the brain and the poison. I love those stairs. We find a corpse down there and- Whoa! Thanks for doing the dishes, Ives. Thanks for making dinner. It was nice. I'm just- I'm just glad you're eating again. It got me a little worried, you know, this whole... Can we just forget about it? I'm fine. There is nothing to worry about.
In the basement, Joe grabs the brain and encounters his first choice, which poison to use on Sophie. Unlike in the original game, both the red and blue poison will make Sophie explode all over the walls. However, you can also refuse to inject her, in which case she'll do it herself. We'll discuss this later. So you bring the brain back up to Dr. Z, who then sticks it in the head of the lady on the table. You flip the switch on his electrical current, and it appears to yield no response. Dr. Z leaves to troubleshoot, and, in his absence, the young lady named Agnes comes to life. Hello? Where? What is- Hello? Stop. Whoever you are, don't come any closer. It's okay. I'm not gonna hurt you. Thank you, and I'm so very glad that you said that, but... But that's not the only problem here. I woke up, I'm butt naked, and I'm really freaking cold. She's naked, so you need to bring her a dress. Fortunately, you know just where to find one. Here. Put this on. Really? A wedding dress? Okay, whatever. Fuck it. Go over there for a second and I'll put this thing on. Yeah, there's blood on it. Be honest with me. Did you butcher somebody's wife to be to get this dress? Yep. I shall avenge her. Mercilessly. How do I look? You look very nice. Aw, thank you. It's not really my color, and it's a bit tight around the waist. But I guess you can't afford to be picky when you wake up covered in blood in a strange room with no recollection of who you are. Do you at least remember your name? Why, do you not know it? I figured we were friends, but now that you've asked, you could be anyone, really. A deranged psychopath, for all I know. Ha! Wait. Maybe I do know your name. Let me think. Your name is Agnes. Damn right it is. Cool. So, we do know each other, then? Not really. A guy who runs this place told me your name. And... how did he know? Apparently, it was embroidered on your knickers. So he took them! Just wait till I get him! <laughs> this is the only time anything like this ever shows up. Now that Agnes is dressed, she opts to follow you around. 
You can even be a bit flirty with her in your first real conversation. She realizes that you're the Joe Davis she's supposed to give a note to. So she has Joe turn around and walk forward a bit so she can retrieve it from her fat knockers. But as you inch towards the doorway, the Axeman makes an entrance. Agnes? You got a problem. You now have the option to continue either as Agnes or as Joe. You'll play both ultimately, it's just a matter of which story you see first. Continuing as Joe, we get a scene of him and Ivy lying in bed, where Ivy opens up about her body image and, depending on your dialogue choices, maybe her eating disorder. Joe can either be supportive and understanding or condescending and dismissive. At the end of this talk, Ivy suggests that the two of you get a cat. Joe, perhaps after running through every dialogue option, suggests that they name it Lucifer. He also considers asking this crazy cat lady next door if she has any kittens. And then Joe wakes up in a coffin underground. This is not fucking happening. Let me out! Is there anyone there? There's no one out there, Joe. You might as well give up now. It's easier that way. Who are you? It's been so long. You've forgotten their names long ago. It all just doesn't matter when you're dead. How do you know my name? The maggots told us. They told us all about you. Maggots that look like people. But you mustn't trust them. Because they're maggots. All they want is to. All that maggots want is. To eat your fucking brain, Joe. <laughs> Funny fellas, them maggots. Where am I? This place has many names. Some call it the Void. Some call it the Grave. Some call it Six Feet Under. And some call it the Tomb. But we like to call it... Wait for it, Joe. The Paradise of the Rotten Flesh. <laughs> I'm not gonna die like this. There's gotta be a way. Oh, but there is. Look around you. Closely. It seems that someone's left a little gift for our good friend, Joe. Lucky him. Always let a charmed life this one. You know very well what it is, Joe. The only way out of here. The only escape. The question is... Are you man enough to do it? Do you have the balls? Will you do what you've gotta do? One pull of a trigger, and it's all over. All there's left is to do the right thing and save your face. Not that there'll be much of it left if you do fire that gun. <laughs> you now have the choice to shoot yourself or to wait. It doesn't really matter which you choose, because even if you do try to shoot yourself, you come to find that the gun isn't loaded. And then you start to play as Agnes. She comes to in another hotel room, and someone starts banging on the door. She ties some bedsheets together and climbs down out the window, just as we see the Axemen break down the door. Outside of the hotel, Agnes finds a car. She needs to put something heavy on the pedal so that it breaks through the gate, uh, so she knocks over a statue and chooses a piece of it to take. 
For our purposes, I'll be taking the statue's penis, because not only does this earn you the prestigious penis award achievement, but it also is the single most influential factor on obtaining the golden ending. That was a joke. Agnes places the rock-hard cock on the gas pedal, and the car reverses right through the gate. She walks a bit farther into the forest and finds herself in a slender the eight pages sort of maze. After wandering around for a bit, Agnes realizes that she's trapped, and is still being pursued by the Axemen. Shortly thereafter, Agnes finds Ivy sitting in the middle of the maze. Hello? Who are you? I'm Ivy. Okay. Hi, Ivy. I'm Agnes. I'm terrible with names, so I probably won't remember it anyway. Just say what you want and leave me be. I'm not looking for company. I promise I won't take much of your time. Someone's following me. We need to get out of here. I can't. But it's some crazy mother. He's got an axe. to leave. She's a god and the devil. A trickster. A demon. Okay, okay. I get it. Good. Then get out of here while you still can. But how? This place is full of dead ends. I'm lost. There is one way. It leads right through her house. But... Maybe. Maybe you can make it. There's a door in one of these rooms here. It won't open without a handle. You'll need to make one. Make a door handle? Not a real handle. Just one suited for a door like this. You can either let Ivy stay where she is, or have her follow you. And to create this door, as Ivy says, Agnes paints a door handle on a wall. When she enters, Ivy, if she was following you, is locked out, and Agnes is greeted by this. I'm so sorry. Welcome to my house, young lady. Who... who are you? I have so many names. It's hard to pick them, but the only thing that truly matters is who you think I am. An unlucky victim of lip augmentation gone wrong? Closer. I'm not as scary as they paint me. We enter the house of the Queen of Maggots, who offers us some soup. Okay. This soup is... <sighs> Blood. It's tomato. The Queen says that Joe has already tasted her blood soup, for he is a vampire, a parasite. And if you pry enough, the Queen reveals her true identity to Agnes. You said you have many names. I'm just curious which one is real. I've not used my real name for a long time. I don't need names. I am the Queen of Maggots, adored and feared by all. And this is my kingdom of death. 
But there was once another name, am I right? Yes, there was. But why would I tell you about it? You don't even belong here. Just passing through. I have no quarrel with you, young lady. I'll eat the soup if you tell me. Lorelei. That's pretty. Thank you for telling me. But... I'm afraid I lied about the soup. So... I think I'll better go now. Goodbye, Lorelei. The queen instructs you, if you won't eat her soup, to at least blow out one of her candles, because it's a tradition in her house. With the queen having disappeared, Agnes finds a way of prying Joe out of his coffin. It's you! What were you even doing in there? I was just about to shoot myself in the head. Oh, come on. Agnes asks, now that she and Joe are reunited, what her purpose is in all of this. And here she embodies my deepest existential fears. Hey, Joe? Why am I here? I mean, what is my purpose in all this? The doctor said you were important, but he didn't really explain why. Important? I like the sound of that. Bear in mind that the doctor seemed crazy as a loon. Now, don't be jealous, Joe. Just because I'm more important than you. Yeah, yeah, whatever. But can we please go now? I don't want to see another coffin for the rest of my life. Joe and Agnes find themselves back in the Quiet Haven Hotel, and the Queen's house becomes inaccessible to them. Maybe this would be a good time to explain what's going on? Holy mother of- I'm just gonna cut this short. Are you sure? It seems there's a lot going on here. You're right. Let's start from the very beginning, then. Yay! Story time! It's not really the kind of story you'd like to hear. I expected that much, but let's hear it anyway. I came here last night with my wife, Ivy. I just wanted to forget about the problems for a couple of days. Just... Have a good time, you know, like we used to. Yep. So, I arranged a little romantic getaway, a weekend in a nice country hotel. This place. But instead, I think we actually broke up. You think? She was acting strange from the start. At first, she wouldn't even talk to me. And then, when she finally did, we were pretty horrible to each other. Both said a lot of things we didn't mean. And the next day she was gone. Gone home? No. Taken away. Kidnapped. I know this sounds absolutely fucking crazy, but... It was a monster. Have you seen it? to kill four memories of this monster to open the mirror. What? They're ghosts. Memories. Is anything here real anyway? This is all just a bad dream, and I'm not gonna think twice about it when it comes to saving it. But you can't. Dream or not, I can't believe you would do such a thing. I've already killed one. I'll kill all of them if that's the only way. You... killed somebody?
Yes. And you really believe Ivy's inside the mirror? Yes. You'll change your mind when you see them. The first one practically begged me to kill her. Yeah. Still not a fan of this venture, I'm afraid. But I'll hold my judgment for now. Okay. Anything else I need to know about? Do we need to blow up an atomic bomb at some point? Are we opening an interdimensional portal for the man-eating beast to plunder the Earth? You've got... someone else's brain. What? Whose brain? I don't know. So now it's on to the next Sophie, who you find on the third floor in this bathroom. On the other side of the third floor is the third Sophie's 18th birthday party. We see that she hates herself because a man named Harrison won't love her, because apparently she's not skinny enough for him. So she says that to cope, she's going to eat. A lot. We talk to this Harrison, who is indeed a massive ween. He asks you for a cigarette and hits on Agnes while she distracts him so that you can loot his coat pockets. Now, if you stop talking for just a moment, sweetheart, how about I show you my room? I don't think so. Come on, girl. You know you want to. It's time to go, honey. Oh, pardon me. I didn't realize you two were a couple. But hey, if, if you get tired of him, you know where to find me. You okay? Right as rain, honey. What you now need to do is turn the gas on in the cellar and turn on the oven knobs in the bathroom on the third floor, but the axe man is pissed off that you took his brain and he turns the gas off, so you have to take a circular saw and cut the brain out of the pig in the freezer room and give it to the brainless axe man, and then do that whole song and dance with the gas again. <sighs> and then, give Harrison a cigarette, so he goes and smokes in the bathroom, blowing up both himself and the bathroom Sophie. It's pretty much the exact same as in the original game. Joe. Now he's half the man he used to be. Shut up, Joe. Just shut up. Oh, and also, in that room where you get the circular saw, you can find the final part of Ivy's letter. I miss you. In Harrison's pocket was his room key, so you're now able to explore his room, in which we find Sophie's secret recipe for a smoothie. It is now cooking time! What you doing there, Joe? Cooking. Is that... is that a human head? Is that a human head?! <laughs> Back on the second floor, you find Ivy! You're alive! What's wrong with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. You find 18-year-old Sophie in Harrison's room, along with Harrison's body. Sophie is relatively eager to drink the smoothie you've prepared for her, which causes her to pull some puke and become skeleton. So anyway, we leave the room and <coughs> the receptionist confronts Joe once again and says she has a proposition to discuss with him up in her office. Hey kids, I just thought I'd remind you that this is the third video in a video series. Um, I don't want to reveal anything too soon, but we will be operating in this analysis 
based off of our knowledge of the cat lady. So if you haven't uh, seen my video on the cat lady, or if you haven't played the cat lady, you might want to watch my video on it. Um, because if you don't have that knowledge, you might be a little bit confused. So, on the fourth floor, there's another door that leads to an outdoor area. Here we see a house, which Joe recognizes as his and Ivy's dream home. It is inside this house that we find the final Sophie, whom Joe is not yet able to kill. Also, we get treated to this. Hey, what's that? This? That's... Um, it's weed. Weed? Like cannabis? Yep. There's a lot of it in there. Yep. Oh, and it stinks. Yep. Do you smoke this stuff, Joe? Yep. Also on the fourth floor, there's a piano that you can play. Hey, I know this one. It's, uh... It's Coldplay, right? I'm sure I've heard it before. Keep playing, I've almost got it. You're pretty good, Joe. Nah, mm, uh, I haven't played in years. And of course, there's the receptionist's office as well. And here's my American boy. I knew you'd come, but I didn't think you'd bring a chaperone with you. Now you basically have to follow her trail of clothes into her secret bedroom. And upon entering said bedroom, Agnes will be locked outside. We see Agnes reflecting an image of Ivy in all these mirrors here, and the Axeman approaches her. Agnes! What took you so long, handsome? Inside the bedroom, Joe finds- <laughs> And the manageress describes how she and Joe are a perfect match for each other because she's never emotional. Or anorexic. She also points out a gift she's left for Joe, which turns out to be a bloody fire axe. The manageress claims that Agnes was not a real person after all, but rather a monster, a parasite, as we are presented with this horrific image. And you now have the choice of whether or not to kill monster Agnes. Regardless, you ask the receptionist right in the noggin. Joe breaks down the door to Sophie number four, and...
back in his apartment complex, Joe exchanges his axe for a chainsaw. I play the piano after dark for two minutes. But no one does anything when there's real bloody noise in the middle of the night. The door's wide open. Hello? End of the road, bitch. Just ask the cat. Still a way to bring you back. Come. In Joe's flat, Susan starts investigating the noise, and Joe carries his lifeless ivy to the fifth floor of Quiet Haven. Susan plunges down the hole in Joe's floor, and Joe passes by a figment of his father. got there, son? Another dead body to add to the list? Dad? You know, your mother always loved Robbie more. He was such a happy kid. Always smiling. And you... You let him fucking die. Fuck you, Dad. Fuck. You. Well, it doesn't even matter anymore. My life ended the moment. Your mother... I know you remember. You were there too. You didn't even cry. Go to hell. I'll finish my cigarette and I'll go. There's nothing left for me here. You're a grown man. This home is yours now. Enjoy.
Ah, I see you have taken matters into your own hands, young man. I do appreciate a good initiative, but I'm afraid it's not going to work. I thought you were dead. No! No! Death is but a state of mind, and my mind has always been a wandering one. What do you want? I felt inclined to inform you that what you are trying to achieve here is, well, pointless. Why? It worked before. I brought Agnes back. This whole idea was flawed from the start. There simply isn't enough power here to alter the subject's state of mind. No one has that kind of power. Well, except the subject herself, perhaps. But as you see, sadly, she is not willing to cooperate. Then what am I supposed to do? Your only option would be to turn around, leave, and never come back here again. Just like that. You've caused quite a stir, you see. Not everyone might perceive your actions as an act of chivalry. They... They won't understand. They never do. Nothing is impossible. You are a stubborn one. So fine, go and see for yourself. Do it. Just do it. Meanwhile, Susan makes a weapon, with which to take out Joe. So now it's ending time. See, the Downfall remake uh, differs from the other games in the series in the way that it calculates your ending. So at the beginning of the game, you have 27 the cat skulls, which are like symbolic of your actions throughout the game. So whenever you say or do something that the game like considers shitty, like, for example, killing Agnes or telling Ivy that her eating disorder is stupid, uh, you lose one of those skulls. So for the normal ending, you need to have some, but you can't have all of the skulls. And for the bad ending, you have to lose every single skull. And then for the golden ending, you have to keep all of them. So I'm going to start by describing the normal ending and the bad ending and then the golden ending. So, buckle up, you demented kiddos. In the normal ending, Susan whacks Joe as he attempts to revive Ivy. Ivy is super for sure dead, but at least we get to see Mitzi. So yeah, the building burns and Joe escapes the scene with Ivy's body in a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the original game's ending. Now for the bad ending. Still breathing, eh? You are one tough son of a bitch, Joe. But I've got bad news, neighbor. This crazy cat lady knows how to deal with nasty parasites like you. Meow. There's no hiding in the basement Cause the boogeyman needs no key My little trap take over Oh, 
So, is Susan tells someone to kill themselves? And also has a bunch of serial killer trophies of the parasites she's killed, including Joe and Ivy's wedding rings. Fucking excuse you. The building doesn't burn or anything, only Joe and Ivy. And it seems that Mitzi's dead in this ending, considering the inclusion of her photo on Susan's death shelf. So, I guess this ending presents us with a sort of butterfly effect, wherein not only does Joe become the worst version of himself, but Susan does as well, knocking off the sixth parasite and becoming the ruthless killer. I don't know why she tells someone to kill themselves, though. That's odd. Finally, we have the golden ending. Susan arrives and whacks Joe, and then Mitzi shows up. Only this time, Susan finds that Ivy has a pulse. We need an ambulance. Mitzi? She's gone already. Gorgeous. Can you help me get up? I'll be fine. Are we good? Yeah. We're good. And it wouldn't really be a golden ending if our girl Susan died, so the newspaper we see after the skull count confirms her survival. So yeah, there's the whole game. Meow. Part 2. Analysis. So this is analysis is gonna be a little uneven in terms of how in-depth we go for each detail. As you might expect, um, it's because I've already analyzed the shit out of the original. Um, so I'll kind of give a spark notes of that analysis here before diving in a little bit deeper to the newer story beats. The details of everything is like roughly the same between the games, but actually a lot of the overarching themes are quite different. So let's hit it. <laughs> Starting with the prologue, Joe watches his brother Robbie die, and we glean from the game's finale that Joe felt the blood was on his hands. Also, we hear of his mother's subsequent suicide, for which Joe also feels responsible. Ivy saw Joe's brother die, so she definitely sustained some trauma from that as well, even if it's true that she didn't remember Joe when they met again as adults. And as a child, Ivy had body image issues instilled in her by her mother. And as an adult, we see that Ivy displayed signs of anorexia and bulimia. Depending on how you play the game, Joe could have been supportive of Ivy in trying to recover from her disorder, or he could have trivialized it entirely. Also, they got a, a black cat, because Ivy loves black cats. When the couple arrives at the hotel, Ivy speaks for the first time since the car ride, and she pleads with Joe to leave the hotel. Joe refuses because a storm is coming, and Ivy calls the receptionist a liar. Also, they're forced to take a room with two single beds instead of a double, which definitely speaks to the distance between them and the rift that Joe and Ivy's respective issues are causing. 
Upstairs, Ivy describes blacking out and being overcome by the influence of Sophie. And against the receptionist's warning, Joe and Ivy argue, awakening Sophie literally and metaphorically. Ivy tried to warn Joe about the impending shitstorm, but, well, here we are! Let's talk more about Sophie. Sophie is a representation of Ivy's body image issues consuming her. And the analogy makes a bit more sense in this version. In the original, Sophie wanted to become obese for Mr. Harris, but in the remake, she starves herself for Harrison. This definitely makes more sense as a direct parallel to Ivy. And as Sophie does to Ivy, the Axeman pursues Joe, a harbinger of guilt and madness. Speaking of the Axeman, the receptionist doesn't tell us the Devonshire Axeman story like she does in the original, he just, it just sort of happens. There's a couple of these instances of exposition being scrapped in the remake. In the original game, we see a very clear tie drawn between Dr. Z and Joe's IRL psychologist. Joe still has a psychologist named Zellman, but he isn't really discussed. We don't even really read anything about Joe's appointments like in the original, so the psychiatrist here is kind of more of an Easter egg than anything, with his name only showing up once. Dr. Z is also a lot more benign in this version. Regardless of which route you play, he only shows up twice, once to revive Agnes, and again at the end to talk you out of bringing Ivy back to life. However, he delivers a very crucial line as you are attempting to revive Ivy. Death is but a state of mind. There simply isn't enough power here to alter the subject's state of mind. No one has that kind of power. This is a very nice nod to one of the game's themes, that you can't make someone get better unless they themselves want to. Ivy being killed, presumably by Sophie, is really just her being consumed by her own mind. Death is just a state of mind, bro. Eating disorders are particularly notorious for having a stubborn grasp on their sufferers. The sufferers in question liken them to addiction, and many see it as their comfort despite it being their torment because it's a source of control over their lives. Though here we only hear the rationale of I want to be thin so that I'm loved, which yeah, sure, that's a part of it. But the control is such a massive aspect of the disorder. I mean, just look at the overlap between eating disorders and OCD. Now here's the major difference in the Downfall remake from the original game. Joe's morality is not half as cut and dry as in the original. Here he's portrayed, I, I think, a lot more sympathetically. Joe's presented as a lot less delusional here, and he isn't shown all that much to have a savior complex like in the original. We seem to get the same foreshadowing as in the original, that things aren't as Joe thinks they are, like when young Sophie calls the hotel the madness, or when Susan finds the cat skull in Joe's apartment oven, calling back to Joe burning the cat in the furnace. But it is indicated through the other characters that Joe shouldn't give up on Ivy, no matter what. Even if it seems like this isn't what Ivy would have wanted. The thing with us women is that sometimes we say one thing and mean exactly the opposite. <laughs> Men are writing women. <laughs> Going off of the neutral and bad ending, it does seem that Joe suffers from delusions leading to his downfall. But it's only kind of subtly hinted at, and we don't really know how much was real. It's implied that he killed five people, and we know the apartment complex slash hotel burned, but that's about it. Agnes, who is also kind of Ivy, we'll touch on that later, is even repulsed by a lot of Joe's actions, but in the golden ending, he's actually able to save Ivy and rekindle their relationship and Agnes tries to help Joe in his goal no matter what, even if he fucking kills her. Agnes is actually treated much more like a major character in the remake than she is in the original. In the original, she just shows up to save Joe and follow him around, and then after the credits, she either gets married or goes to hell. In the remake, she also actually has access to Ivy mid-game when she encounters her in the maze. She's able to talk to her, and even convince her to try and get out of her sort of mind prison, which is one of the requirements to get the golden ending. So, I guess, in a way, this is that hopeful part of Ivy choosing life, as Dr. Z would say. And, just like in the original, she's able to talk to the Queen of Maggots, too. So, we'll, uh, we'll, dis we'll discuss that next time.
The receptionist says that for Joe to move on from Ivy and be with her, Agnes must be destroyed, because she sort of embodies Joe's undying love for Ivy, and the parts of her that he just can't get over. This is nicely underlined in that one scene where Agnes and Joe fist bump each other, the same way that he and Ivy made up as kids. The receptionist gives Joe the axe to kill Agnes, which she can refuse to do, so there's kind of this implication that there's an outside force drawing Joe into doing bad things rather than him just neglecting his own mental issues. The receptionist has always been sort of an odd character. The only purpose she really serves is to give exposition, play with Joe's mind, and try to make him cheat on Ivy. In the remake, her backstory isn't really explained so much as it is hinted at, as we see the shadow of her hanging body in her office. It's probably safe to say she's another victim of the Queen of Maggots if we bring in some evidence from the original game, as she dealt with her loneliness and sadness in life in the very wrong way, which was to, uh, listen to all those ghosts in the walls and uh, kill herself before trying to bang a living married man. The receptionist tells Joe that Agnes is really just a parasite, which sort of sounds like she's implicating Ivy as just a mentally unstable person leeching off of Joe and trying to bring him down with her. Speaking of, one change I really liked in the remake was how Ivy was explored a bit more. Again, you need to actively try and read all of her notes in order to be good husband and get that golden ending. So we see that Ivy does miss Joe, and she doesn't really want him gone, like Agnes says, but she feels that she is too damaged to carry on in this relationship and so she pushes her support away. It's definitely not like this isn't a real thing that people do in relationships. I mean, hell, <laughs> I've done it. Because it's so easy to get carried away with suffering and mistakenly try to ensure damage control over people that you weren't really hurting at all. It's so easy to take that notion of hurt people hurt people and try to take control by just hurting alone. Ironically though, that's often the most damaging thing you can do to everyone. So, Redux says that Ivy does still want Joe, actually, and while on the surface it's pretty weird, <laughs> I think it's a little more justified by all the detail added to Ivy's headspace. Uh, yeah, and that's all I gotta say about that. Part 3. Review. Downfall Redux, just like the other games in the series, is very intriguing in terms of story and aesthetic, although gameplay is limited. The look is very updated, and it's really cool to see the major jumps in quality between all these games, especially with a reimagining of such an old adventure game. Here we actually get some CGI clips and elements, and I think it makes the game a lot more uncanny than the other games in a way that totally works. The voice acting is also stellar. I had a bit of concern hearing the child acting in the prologue, but there's some great performances here. Everyone's voice is very fitting, and I particularly like listening to Jesse Gunn as Joe, and David Firth makes a return as Dr. Z. I had no idea it was him until I read the credits, but his performance is hilarious. I also think Agnes was perfectly cast. She's very spunky, but also sounds like cute and girly. It's a good added dimension to that character. Now let's talk about gameplay and replay value and whatnot. There's many dialogue options and actions right from the beginning of the game to the end that will affect your ending. So unless you've gotten a quote unquote genocide or pacifist run already and are just going for a neutral run, you do have to play the whole game again just to get to that other ending, which would be fine, but there's just not many differences between runs because most of your ending rides on like very specific dialogue choices. Fortunately, it's not a very long game and there's not a lot of super long cutscenes like in The Cat Lady. Speaking of super long cutscenes, here's something super embarrassing. So in The Cat Lady vid, I raged over the fact that you can't skip any dialogue and well, you, you can. A commenter pointed out to me that you literally just have to press space, and somehow I never tried that. I thought I did, but well, obviously I didn't. So thank you, commenter, and I am very sorry, the cat lady, I have unfairly criticized you. 
They got rid of the blind guessing on the Sophie poison bit, which is kind of nice now that the choice between the two chemicals is just sort of a red herring, but like, why the choice to shoot yourself in the coffin if it's not even loaded anyway? That seems pretty pointless. And also, why the option to continue playing as either Agnes or Joe if you'll just play both in the end? I mean, it's kind of cool that you get to choose, but I was sort of expecting there to be some change in the game, depending on which you chose first. Ah well, I suppose. So yeah, I feel that the major choices here aren't quite as heavy or interesting as in the other games. That being said, I really like that the endings are dialogue dependent. It makes you have to like fully embody alternate versions of Joe rather than making just a couple of big choices to get a new ending. I feel like the consistent importance of dialogue makes it so that some of those big choices, like choosing whether to shoot yourself, aren't really necessary to maintain that choice's matter component strongly. And thank god there's no boss fight in the remake. Admittedly, if there were a boss fight, the enemy sprite probably would have looked pretty cool, but it's just not necessary for these games. And like, how do you even make an interesting battle in an adventure game like these? And it doesn't have any weird quick time events like that one in the cat lady, which is nice. Again, it's pretty neat seeing this little indie studio slash dev figuring their shit out and producing increasingly polished games, kind of grappling with the issue of gameplay in a series of more uh, narrative focused games. I do think though that thematically Redux is a little more confusing than the original. The comparison between Joe and the Axemen are still there, but in no ending does he really go full nuts and kill everyone like in the original. I mean, it kind of makes sense that the Axemen Joe comparison is still there, because it represents Joe's past guilt, but in the remake it doesn't really feel like Joe is desperate to prove something, to save Ivy so as to make up for that guilt. The guilt is just kind of there. And there's still hints of Joe's actions to save Ivy being extreme since they upset Agnes, but, but it's not necessarily that he's blinded by this faulty goal like in the original, because assuming he's good to Ivy and Agnes and like doesn't inject the first Sophie, his actions are actually rewarded. In the golden ending, Ivy is alive and real and they run away together. In the normal and bad ending, Joe just fails to bring her back to life because he didn't try hard enough. Now in the original, Joe was condemned for this savior complex that he had, thinking he could fix Ivy, but here we are explicitly told that Joe should try to save Ivy, even if she says she doesn't want him to. Like I get it, don't give up on the ones you love if they're being self-destructive, but it just feels like a full 180 from the original. Also, there's definitely a bit of context missing for certain things if you haven't played the original, like that aforementioned man address backstory, uh, but it's never a super big deal, it just leaves like a couple questions for those who've only played Redux. All in all, it's a cool imagining that on the surface is very faithful to the original, but is thematically quite different. Part 4. Eggs. Egg number one. Joe talks about zombie cats and how they don't exist in the prologue. This seems to me to be a callback to the zombie cat gag when you prank Brian and the cat lady. Egg number two. In the Quiet Haven Hotel, there is a portrait of a cat in the lobby. The plaque beneath reads that his name is Teacup, the Keymaster. You may remember Susan's cat named Teacup from the cat lady. Egg number three. The clock you pick up to lure the cat into the furnace is the same clock we see in Susan's room. In the cat lady. Again. Egg number four. So the queen says her name is Lorelei if you press her. I guess we'll have to discuss that in the next video. Egg number five. Yet another tie into the cat lady, the first Sophie's room looks just like the room we find Ivy in, in the cat lady. Egg number six. Dr. Z says the title of the game. I'm a doctor. If I can't save us all from this downfall, then no one can. 
If we take the reading that Dr. Z is Joe's IRL therapist, which is a little more ambiguous in this version, we could interpret this as Frank Zellman trying to save Joe from himself. But that's if we look at the game as though it's just like the original, meaning like almost none of the game's events actually happen, which uh, we already kind of got into. Egg number seven. Dr. Z likes to see the sick things troubling people's little minds. If we look at my analysis of Dr. X and the Cat Lady, this very much lines up with the whole fascination with damaged people and the delusion that some people have that they can fix those people like a project. Egg number eight. Ivy refers to Sophie as a maggot, so we may be able to assume that the queen of maggots is the queen of maggots like Sophie, i.e. a queen of suffering. Egg number nine. Every time Joe says, who are you, it's the same voice clip. I think it's really funny. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Wait a minute! Who are you? Esto concluye los huevos. Part 5 lingering questions. So this time, I've got some very basic questions and very little <laughs> and very little evidence to support them any particular way. Okay, so first of all, and this is something that's been gnawing at me <laughs> for all of these games. Why are there so many cats in this series. I mean, as far as I can tell, it's just because, you know, cats are cool. Which, like, fair enough. But, you know, I'll keep an eye on it, see if there's any other plausible reason. But, I mean, um, the only, like, particular thing that I've noticed thus far is cats tend to be sort of the companions of, like, mentally ill people or people who are suffering a lot. So... Cats are cool, I guess. <laughs> Again, I'll just keep an eye on that as we go forward. Also, why is there so much, like, elephant decor in the Quiet Haven Hotel? I, I have literally no idea as to why that would be, but there's just, like, elephants everywhere. And that always struck me as odd, because elephants have never really been a theme in these games. I mean, I guess there's, like established literary meanings behind elephants, but none particularly come to mind. Maybe I just haven't researched them enough as a literary device, but they also just show up, like, in, like, the main area of the Quiet Haven Hotel and nowhere else, so... Elephants are cool, I guess! <laughs> Lastly, and this one may have a non-lore explanation, but is that scene at the end of chapter six of the Cat Lady real? You know, the one where like Joe has Ivy in that electric chair and he's shocking her and she's like obese and naked, of course. Like, was that real? Because in every ending of Redux, Ivy's like, not part of the illusion, right? Because Susan, like, even if you get the bad ending, Susan refers to her, like, as Joe's wife. And Susan knows what Ivy looks like, because she's seen her in, like, the hall. Even in, yeah, even in the bad ending, it's just real Joe and real Ivy burning together. I think this is probably just, like, a little bit of dissonance caused by unforeseen story changes that were coming in Redux. It's like a really recognizable scene from the original that like effectively teased the remake, but it never actually came back in the remake. So I just thought that was funny. Conclusion. <sighs> so that was Downfall. This video took me a long time to make for many reasons. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, this is 
the second to last video in this video series <clears throat> until Burn House Lane comes out. But this is a crazy game, it's a crazy series, and it gets even crazier next time in Lorelei. So I really hope that you guys have been enjoying these videos. Again, I'm streaming the games for a limited time only on my Twitch channel. Uh, and yeah, I am going to try and whip my own ass into shape and get the Lorelei video out way, way faster. But anyway, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. I've gotten a crazy amount of support over this series. I'm still a teeny, itty little, bitty channel, but I have, like, never had this much support over something I've created, and it's pretty awesome. It's, like, really cool seeing how dedicated the fan base of these games are, even though, like, the games aren't super popular. Carolina got a little popular, but the games, like, in general aren't super popular, so I just think that's awesome to have that they have, like, such a strong community. But anyway, I'm almost done with these games, <laughs> which is a little sad, but uh, tune in next time! When I talk about Lorelei, thank you and good night. Bonus part, chapter five of the Cat Lady, because I fucked up and now my career is tarnished forever. Okay, so my thoughts on chapter five are basically this. So probably the biggest thing holding Susan back in her depression recovery is her unwillingness to just confront the root of her misery. I mean, she freaks out on Mitzi when she tries to bring it up. Ultimately though, we come to understand why Susan committed suicide, and like many situations that contribute to a depression, it's awful. But perhaps not quite as scary to confront as Susan thought. She's no murderer, she was just living life, struggling in her marriage, and didn't realize that she was making a fatal mistake. But a part of her must have felt that she deserved the suffering following her daughter's death. Now about that bit with the ship dock. This scene is really interesting to me because Susan basically just murders a bunch of alternate versions of herself. For one, the version of Susan that awoke in the field after her suicide needs to be eviscerated. <laughs> and then there's a monster that Susan remarks looks a bit like herself. Susan brings the psych ward version of herself with her to the bottom of the sea, where they both die. So to me, this is Susan sort of putting her old self to rest and moving forward, especially now that she's about to confide in Mitzi and continue her path to recovery. I think the fact that this happens on a shick do- shick, 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 shick razors. I think the fact that this happens on a ship dock in particular could be a sort of callback to Susan's river poem as well, where she contemplates jumping back into the water, so to speak. And that's for real all I have to say about anything ever goodbye.